Hello, and welcome back to Beyond Networks, the evolution of living systems. We've covered a bunch of different perspectives on evolutionary theory, structural perspectives, units of selection, functional perspectives, replicators and interactors, uh, process perspectives from um, structural, uh, process structuralism to developmental systems theory to James Chrismer's reproducer. And so we're gonna move on and see how this reproducer perspective in particular fits into a perspective on evolution that takes the organism as an agent, an autonomous agent, really seriously. And so before I do that, I wanna just quickly um, repeat what we said in last lecture about the reproducer. So reproducers, because that's gonna be very important for this argument here, basically the basis for the argument. Uh, reproducers uh, are biological entities able to produce more entities of their own type. That's not very mysterious. To achieve this, reproducers must acquire the capacity to reproduce, which uh, Grismer calls development. Um, and that provides the ontogenetic closure of the life cycle. So development in this view, this is very important to remember, um, comprises all the different processes that are involved in closing a life cycle. It can also happen in a unicellular organism. So we're talking about all kinds of metabolic, physiological, developmental processes that are happening and are functionally important for closing the life cycle. And replicators, genes are the prime example and the only uncontroversial one, um, are a special kind of reproducer. And they are deeply embedded in a hierarchy of levels of reproductive organization. This is one of the concluding sentences of, uh, sentences of uh, Grismer's paper. So what is reproductive organization? Uh, we have to connect this idea back to the organizational account of the organism if we want to understand how reproduction um, comes into the account of uh, autopoiesis or self-maintenance through operational closure. And we've been through this a couple of times already in this course. So I'm going to just uh, quickly remind you of the main ideas. So basically, organisms are autonomous beings are uh, sort of different from non-living organisms because they show this particular um, organization, which is based on organizational closure. Um, and particularly uh, in the case of uh, this diagram, the closure of constraints. So you have a bunch of processes here indicated by the arrows and they are constrained uh, through these wiggly arrows here. And constraints usually act at a different time scale indicated uh, on the left here and the process they act on. So think about enzymes working uh, on catalyzing different metabolic reactions on the time scale of the metabolic reaction, they are not altered, but then on a larger time scale, they are replenished, uh, degraded, and also rebuilt. And uh, so there are other processes at other time scales that can produce constraints. So constraints can be generated and can generate other constraints. And if every constraint in a system, just like in this diagram, C3, C2, and C4, are generating at least one other constraint and are generated by at least uh, one other constraint, then you have this condition of the closure of constraints. What that means is that the organism can use energy produced within itself to reconfigure its own structure, its organization, and thereby put work into creating more constraints, which is exactly the process that gives it a certain autonomy from the sort of laws of thermodynamics that are guiding the chemical reactions in a non-living world. Okay, so the, this type of self-determination is achieved through self-maintenance, autopoiesis um, of the organization of the organism. So the organization has to be maintained over time. And what we want to do is we want to see how does the process of reproduction fit into this particular picture so we can integrate the reproducer perspective that we learned about last time into this type of organizational account of the organism to get not only a, a scientific account uh, grounding for agency, goal-oriented behavior of organisms, but at the same time, the evolution of agents. Okay, so there's a beautiful paper from 2011 by uh, Christian Saborito, Matteo Mosio, and Alvaro Moreno that um, 
sort of integrates the process of reproduction into their organizational account. And I want to summarize their argument very briefly here. So what is important uh, to notice and point out again, maybe, is that self-maintenance implies uh, an organizational continu continuity during development. And, and remember, development is just sort of the whole of the life cycle. Organizational closure must be maintained throughout the lifespan of an organism, through time. Okay, but as I told you before several times, the structure, the organization itself, doesn't uh, remain the same. It changes at any point in time because of the continuous ongoing regeneration of its organization. So this is the uh, needful freedom and the thermodynamic predicament in Hans Jonas's terms. Organisms have to be active in order not to die all the time. So they also change, they can physiologically adapt um, to different uh, situations they can. Uh, they develop, uh, change throughout their life cycles more or less strongly, so that's not just uh, embryogenesis, and then can change their shape, of course, during uh, embryogenesis or also during between different life stages. Um, regeneration, wound healing, are also part of that sort of constantly changing organization and structure of the organism. So how is it that we consider an organism then the same? Why are you the same person, the same individual that you were when you were two years old? although you don't remember probably. So here's a little thought about that. Various temporal instances of the system must be considered instances of the same encompassing self-maintaining organization to the extent, now this is important, that its constitutive organizational principles are actually transmitted from one instance to another. So what makes you the same organism as you were when you were two years old is not that you have a certain set of attributes, properties that were uh, maintained, that are essential to you being you, but more because there is a, a causal continuity between the two-year-old you and the you watching this video right now, okay? So organismal identity is much more a question, not you know, about finding a sort of a list of essential properties that make you you, but more about looking at the causal continuity of what connects you to your two-year-old persona. And in terms of the properties that you have right now, physically and uh, also character-wise, there's very little you have in common with you as a two-year-old, okay? So organizational continuity is a specific type of uh, gen identity, which is basically causal continuity. This is a concept that was introduced by Kurt Lewin in the 1920s and 1922 and then elaborated by Hans Reichenbach in the 50s. Uh, and the, ma the major point here with gen identity is that it is the identity uh, of an entity through time given by a well-identified series of continuous state of affairs. So a continuity criterion for identity, not a set of properties. And organizational continuity is just a special type as we said, of that identity uh, down here. Uh, and that type of gen identity is what gives an organism its own diachronic identity. That's why you are the same person as the two-year-old that has nothing in common with you. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Because there is a problem here with reproduction. Okay, so organizational continuity is what makes, uh, what defines your diachronic identity but it is only a sufficient condition for your diachronic identity when there is no change in the local number of organized systems that are continuous with one another. So imagine that you have children. There is a continuity, a causal organizational continuity between you and your offspring, but you are not identical to them. They are different individuals, okay? So identity is not preserved when fission uh, or fusion of, you can also have mergers of organisms, of organized systems occur, okay? Not necessarily, actually. You can have budding, and then you can say, well, okay, the mother cell is still the same as before, but let's not get into that because that's not the point. The point is that organizational continuity is preserved through reproduction. So if you 
think that organizational continuity is the only criterion for identity, then you would be identical to all your offspring. It's a nice thought. It is actually an amazing thought to think about the organizational continuity of you that goes right back to the first living cell on Earth. Billions of years. There's been organizational continuity ever since the first cell, your earliest ancestor arose on Earth. It's an amazing thought and it also is a very comforting thought if you think that you will be part of that stream, that continual uh, uh, maintenance of organization uh, in the future as well, which doesn't mean your identity will be preserved. So the problem here is that the issues in thinking about uh, reproduction and in integrating it into the organizational accounts arise from a confusion about what delineates an individual and what delineates uh, a self-maintaining um, organized system. Because you could consider the combination of parent and offspring together, which is sort of a mini lineage with two members and therefore any other lineage of organisms, you can consider that a kind of organized biological system as well with self-maintenance, okay? Because in any biological lineage, self-maintenance, uh, organizational continuity has been um, there throughout and across the generations. So what you can do is you can sort of zoom in and out um, in a lineage and either take the individual as the organism with organizational closure or larger parts of a lineage. That's totally okay because of uh, organizational continuity going through, right through the process of, of reproduction. So the offspring causally inherits its organization from its parents. Self-maintenance remains continuous through reproduction as it does through development. Okay, so reproduction is, can be defined in this account as the process that ensures the long-term continuity of a given organismal organization beyond the temporal boundaries of the organism as an individual. And that is sort of, uh, in summary, the ontogenetic closure of the life cycle. Okay, it starts again the life cycle when you have offspring. All right, and it's, it's sort of a natural consequence of, of, of autopoietic uh, organization because if you think about it, you only get an autopoietic system that does not reproduce if the processes of sort of building the system and its decay have the same rates, okay, if they're in a sort of an equilibrium. But if you build up uh, more of yourself than the case, you automatically get either growth or reproduction in this sense. And so the, the, the perfectly balanced self-maintenance is, is a very special case. And uh, self-maintenance and self-reproduction go naturally hand in hand and are based on the same organizational principles. Okay, so Linking this back to the reproducer account, um, we can state that reproduction seen now as the closure of the life cycle involves both development and inheritance. Remember, I mean, you have to have uh, organizational continuity through um, out the life cycle of the individual that's given by the processes of development. And then from generation to generation, that's given by the process of inheritance. Okay, and the other very important point that Grissomer was making and why the reproducer perspective is so useful in this context is that um, it not only requires um, um, copying um, sort of uh, the transfer of information, but also material overlap between the parent and the offspring for causal uh, continuity. And you see why now, because otherwise you couldn't have this organizational continuity. So the organization of the organism has to be physically causally propagated um, through the generations. Okay, so to summarize this, organizational continuity not only underlies, and, and this goes back right to the beginning of the um, lecture, not only underlies self-maintenance self and self-reproduction as I just showed you, but remember from, from when I introduced this account in the first place, it also underlies self-determination. You get both at the same time from the same account, from the same type of organization. And therefore, you also get autonomy and agency of the organism. So as soon as you get an autonomous organism, the origin of life, you get an organism that has self-maintenance, self-reproduction, you get self-determination, autonomy, and agency. And what's more, 
you get evolution for free as well. Because let's compare this to Lewinton's minimal model of Darwinian evolution by natural selection. So what you have in here, you have development, which ensures organizational continuity throughout the life cycle. That's what I just told you. And also remember from uh, last time uh, when I talked about the reproducer, it generates exactly the right type and amount of phenotypic variation that you need for natural selection. So it's a precondition for evolution by natural selection. The process of reproduction is based on organizational continuity across generations and uh, it is required for genetic replication. We talked about that last time. And therefore, it is required for inheritance. And fitness represents the differential capacity simply for self-reproduction at different rates between different individuals in a population. So this fits very neatly into a sort of minimalist account of Darwinian evolution. It also uh, seems to be, you know, uh, the simplest account that we have that actually works. Remember from last time, the replicator account doesn't actually work because it takes all the machinery, all the, oh, I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't say machinery, uh, all the organization that you need to get replication for granted. But this repli uh, reproducer account plus organization of the organism accounts for the the actual conditions for the structure for the organization that you need to get those minimal conditions. And this account, of course, is completely compatible with all the laws um, of, of uh, physics and chemistry and also completely adherence to the, the normal standards of scientific explanation. But it is not a mechanistic explanation, okay? The organizational account, remember, is a structural explanation, not a mechanistic explanation but perfectly scientific. Okay, so we've basically scientifically grounded uh, a whole lot of things here. The agency of the organism, its self-maintenance, its autopoietic nature, but also at the same time, um, Darwinian evolution, which has not been grounded uh, in, in sort of, uh, a, sort of a, a physico-chemical account before. Okay, so what do you get? through the organizational account of the organism is you get both agency and evolution at the same time based on no miracles at all okay but at the, at the same time um, what i just told you all these perspectives are not included in the laws of physics and chemistry they're on top of the laws of physics and chemis chemistry the rules of life emerged when life emerged it built its own rules because it has this autonomy and the agency. But here we have an explanation of where this agency and autonomy comes from. Okay, so this view that I'm presenting here, this agential view of evolution is a strongly emergentist view. It believes that biolog uh, biological evolution and probably also cultural evolution nowadays brings forth new rules. It changes the rules of the game of the universe. So it is emergent. These rules are emergent in a very strong sense of the term as uh, new levels of organization that arise during evolution. So let's compare this sort of view with a sort of a traditional view of evolutionary theory. I'm gonna do something terrible and I'm, I'm gonna draw a straw man here, okay? So this is gonna be a cartoon of traditional evolutionary theory, but just to make the contrast pretty clear, we want to sort of uh, crystallize what the underlying assumptions are. So a very, very, very reductionist, let's say you're Richard Dawkins or someone, uh, John Maynard Smith account of evolution, uh, sees, you know, the organism, gets rid of the organism completely. Here is why, okay? So basically, evolution happens at the level of the genes and the organism, the in, uh, interactor, literally is just an interface. That's what the term interactor uh, implies, right? That sort of gets the genes in touch with the environment. The environment, remember, in this view, just acts as a filter one way um, on the genetic lineages through the interactors. And so what you have here is sort of a view in which a genetic program produces random heritable phenotypic variation. It's an oversimplified view, as we saw, of development. Uh, it produces mutations as well. Um, uh, which underlie the variation. So, uh, and on the other hand, you have natural selection, 
which disposes, it acts as a filter, it disposes of less fit genetic variants. So what is important to note here is that organisms, if they appear at all in the theory, they appear as objects, they suffer passively the consequences of genetic programming, first of all, and natural selection. And uh, they merely act as interfaces. Okay, they mediate between the effect of the genes and the effect of the environment. The environment, it's important to note, is completely passive. It judges the fitness of organisms. It, it poses the problems, as Lewinton was writing, uh, as the product of their genetic program. Lewinton was critical of this view, by the way. The environment is external. That's the other important point. Its existence, nature, and its, the way it changes has have nothing to do with the organism, the activity of the organism itself. So what you get is a clean separation. This is the advantage I told you uh, of the replicator account. Uh, you get an inner realm of the replicator that copies itself, competes and implements the developmental program. And you get an outer realm, which you could call the realm of the niche or the realm of ecology, which selects winnows and molds, molds biological form. And so you have these very strong principles that I've briefly introduced uh, in the last module of environmental autonomy which considers adaptations as responses to pressures exerted on form by an autonomous environment and explanatory uh, externalism, which assumes um, an explanatory primacy, first of all, of adaptation promoting influence of an external environment over uh, presumptively adaptation neutral processes of development and inheritance itself, mutation. Um, so these are old debates in evolution between source, what is the importance of the source rules versus the consequence rules. Okay, so let's contrast this to uh, a, a sort of a, a very abstract, still very much nascent theory of the evolution of agents. So let's just in very broad outlines characterize what such a theory would have to look like. So it would have uh, to incorporate We've talked about this at the end of last module. So I'm, I'm briefly going to summarize a bunch of things we, we heard there. Um, we have to sort of revise our view of adaptation, not as a response to a physical environment, but uh, to an affordance in the experienced environment. Affordances, remember, are opportunities or impediments for the organism to uh, attain its goals. And um, we have to see adaptive evolution as the process by which the adaptive plasticity of organisms, their activity conjointly molds both the organism and its affordances. They're together, remember, by affecting changes in organismal form or the environment through niche construction or both. Okay, so there is no environmental autonomy or explanatory externalism in this theory, but intimate commingling of organism and environment. They co-generate each other. They co-evolve in a very strong sense, you know, not Churchill, but Marx. They, they, they're impredicative. They need each other to exist. They co-generate, they co-emerge together. Organisms are not optimized survival machines in this view, but active agents in their own adaptive evolution. And so that's the important thing. What kind of difference would that make to evolution? This is what we want to find out. I'm going to give you a rather long quote here by Dennis Walsh out of his wonderful book, Organisms, Agency, and Evolution, um, on which this whole second half of this lecture is based. So Dennis is writing, only a goal-directed system can experience its conditions as affordances, okay? So you have to have some teleology in there for this to work. Moreover, a system can only experience its conditions as affordances if it has a repertoire. What does that mean? By repertoire, I mean the set of possible responses that a system can enlist in pursuit of its goal in response to its conditions. So agency means that the organism has some sort of choice, very difficult word. It doesn't deliberate its choices, but it has a bunch of behaviors at its disposal and it can actually select one or the other behavior in response to a goal it wants to attain and the conditions that even further or uh, impede that goal. For this repertoire to constitute the response to affordances as such, it must be biased. That is to say that the system must have the capacity to exploit its behavioral repertoire in, in response to its conditions in ways that are by and large conducive to the attainment or maintenance of its goal. This is what I just said, but carefully phrased because Dennis wants to avoid at any sort of cost here 
to mention words like making decisions or choices or anything that implies conscious thought. Um, for its part, the goal of the system is that state that it tends robustly to attain or maintain by marshalling its behavioral repertoire in response to its affordances. There is nothing magical about these goals. It's just something the organism is going for by choosing a certain behavior. Again, I use all these words with caution. So the concept of agency as I'm using it is located within a triad of con concepts, which are goal, affordance, and repertoire. So the goal is, is grounded in the organizational account of the organism that um, explains why it can have goals in the first place. And then the affordance is grounded in this account of the perceived interaction with the perceived environment. And the repertoire is grounded in dynamical systems theory. You can have different sort of attractors uh, that you can fall into and maybe um, um, sort of build or change uh, your, your, your space of possibilities in a way that molds the configuration space of your dynamics. Okay, so there is nothing magical about this, but not everybody is happy about this type of argument because it's heavily, heavily teleological. And here's Bob Richards, uh, historian of science, who calls this necrophilia of defunct science. This is a quote from Dennis's book. I love it. So this, this sort of resurrection of uh, the final cause that we're talking about here, teleological explanations is necrophilia of defunct science. Why? Because affordances imply teleology and teleology is forbidden. Okay, so what is the problem with teleology? And has always been since it was outlawed by the early mechanicist uh, philosophers and scientists. So there are three um, really big problems with teleology, and we have to be very careful when, when using teleological arguments that they do not fall into one of these traps, okay? The first is an argument from non-actuality. So if you take teleological explanations as causal explanations, then it's really weird because the goal that you try to attain doesn't really exist when you try to attain it. Right? It's something that you try to attain. It's dispositional. It's in the future. It doesn't exist. So how can something that doesn't exist or is in the future uh, affect your behavior in the present? Well, one way to do this is uh, if you're conscious, you can build a mental model of your environment. You're a thinking creature. You can build a model of your environment and that goal exists in the model and that model in your brain can influence your behavior. There's no problem. So that's the argument from intentionality. So you shouldn't use this argument on anything that doesn't have a brain. Okay. And so the last argument against teleology is the argument from normativity that um, having a goal implies some sort of value judgment, okay, that you're making. Um, so that, why is that a bad thing? So let's go from, from the last to the first and look at organisms. So this is basically not a problem anymore if you have the organizational account of your organism that gives you a reason why organisms can have goals. They can have normative goals. They can, a bacterium wants to eat in a way, okay? The second one goes away if you think, uh, if you have an account of agency, which we also get from the organizational account, okay? You don't need a brain to make choices. Again, we don't have, you know, to select different behaviors from the repertoire, to put it more neutrally. And then this one goes away. If you realize that um, teleological explanations, they, they never intended to be causal explanations, okay? So you have to make sure that the explanations, the teleological explanation that you're using um, adhere, you know, are, are waterproof against these sort of criticisms. Some are not like you, um, maybe know about uh, the theory of evolution by uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who believed in this omega point that the whole of evolution would sort of be pulled towards this final state, which was the state that God intended. And the problem, of course, of that is that this really succumbs to uh, this uh, non-actuality problem, okay? So th th this is a causal teleological explanation. It's not okay, okay? But the, the teleological explanations that we're using here by explaining the behavior of goal-oriented organisms is completely okay because teleological explanations are not, not causal or mechanistic explanations at all. So mechanism tries to explain what cause, uh, causes produce an effect while teleological explanations 
of the kind that we were discussing here uh, explain how um, are the means that you have conducive to a certain end, a goal that you have. Okay, so they answer different questions. I mean, that's what Aristotle already pointed out with his four causes. Understanding requires both mechanistic and teleological explanations. How versus why. So how do you um, do something that is uh, mechanistic and, and why? Why do you want to eat? Because you want to live. That is teleological. Okay, and it's only explainable in terms of goals. Now, the idea is here that if you take this perspective, you gain a whole bunch of explanations that not only are uh, perfectly scientific, like I just tried to argue, but also add to the explanatory power that you have if you would only stick with mechanistic explanation. Okay, so the argument is, is that if you take an agential uh, perspective here again it doesn't compete with the other perspectives it adds something to our understanding of evolutionary theory and that's exactly why it's valuable first by enabling us to to compare um, uh, phenomena across perspectives and see which of those are really uh, robust and which of them are not so we get a, not only a broader but also deeper understanding of evolution the more different perspectives we um, we have at our disposal. And so this is very important. And so we should get away from our fear of teleology. This is the return of the final cause and it's not um, conceptual necrophilia. It's okay if you're careful, just like with mechanistic explanations, you have to be careful as well. Okay, so um, Dennis is writing evolution merely appears chancy if we disregard the role of purpose. Aristotle's approach to scientific explanation offers biology an escape from the method methodological straitjacket imposed on it by the strict adherence to mechanism. Okay, it makes things a lot simpler. It gives us a lot better explanations of evolution if we use it. And we really shoot ourselves in the foot if we choose not to. He cheekily calls this methodological vitalism. So there is no real vitalism here, no magical force of life, but he says, these are uh, explanations that only apply in biology. So it sets biology apart from other sciences. So uh, there is a vitalism in the terms of the methodology. If you have methods that you would only use in biology, but um, although it sounds a little provocative, every biologist is a methodological vitalist because every biologist who calls themselves a biologist is not a chemist or a physicist and obviously uses different methods uh, to study their questions. Okay, so let's start wrapping up here. The conclusion is that the agential perspective of evolution leads to a completely different type of theory. That's a very deep insight. That goes back to um, Lee Smolin's arguments and Time Reborn and his um, idea that you can't do physics in a box, that you need to go beyond the Newtonian paradigm to, to describe um, the universe. So Dennis Walsh extends this and says, you also need to go, go beyond the Newtonian paradigm to describe evolution because you need to move from an object theory where organisms are treated as objects, passive objects, to an agent theory, uh, which goes beyond mechanism. So object theories explain the dynamics of a set of objects, okay? Um, while agent theories explain the commingled co-constitution of agents in their environment. So this is this constantly changing configuration space, the space of possibilities here. While on the left, you just have a bunch of, of states and a bunch of possibilities. And that's it. And the forces, laws, and initial conditions that govern the objects are external to the objects. A classic example is, of course, the solar system in classical mechanics. So uh, Smolin and Walsh call, call this transcendence. The rules that govern an, an object's behavior are uh, transcend it itself. It, they're outside the object, okay? While in an agential theory, the agent's activities are generated endogenously from within. Agents cause their own changes in state in response to conditions they encounter because organisms are agents and the universe is closed physically to you know outside influences so everything that happens in the universe must be caused from within so this they call imminence to um, uh, contrast it with transcendence we need uh, so object theories have an explanatory asymmetry basically principles explain the dynamics of objects but objects do not explain the principles themselves while an agent-based uh, theory is explanatory, has explanatory reciprocity, 
where agents both make and respond to the conditions of their existence. Like in Kaufman's view, this adjacent possible that constantly radically emerges all the time. It's a heavily emergent sort of view of the world. So we need a completely different approach that goes beyond the Newtonian paradigm. And we need dif different mathematical tools, different concepts for this. And we're, we haven't even started developing those because we've been so stuck on the mechanistic worldview that we didn't dare to go beyond it. We need to go beyond it in a scientific way, which I have tried to philosophically ground uh, in these lectures over the last few modules here. So what you end up with is what Dennis calls fractionated Darwinism, sort of split brain. Uh, on one hand, which provides simple and useful theories, but very abstract and limited. You have to be careful. These, these uh, theories, they, they only apply under certain conditions that you need to, to be aware of. And so uh, his own situated Darwinism is a realistic account of the metaphysics of evolution, but it's not worked out in a way that we can actually apply it yet. And maybe we'll, we'll never be able to. But, um, and also you need to consider what do you want to get out of science? Maybe it's not it's very probably not going to be a predictive science that allows you to control evolution. If this is what we want, we have to stick with the mechanistic worldview, but the mechanistic worldview only covers very little of what's actually going on in the universe. And also it doesn't cover the universe itself. That is small in volume. Okay, what would an agent theory of evolution look like? We don't know yet, but there's some very general outlines that I can give you here. So, it would be based on something called agential emergentism. Evolution is basically an ecological phenomenon arising from the purposive engagement of organisms with their conditions of existence. And that engagement, the activity they have in their perceived environment is creating the rules of the game constantly afresh, every moment new rules, okay? You cannot separate inheritance, development, selection, and mutation. I tried to give you that insight through this sort of increasingly complex um, sort of series of perspectives, and especially the reproducer perspective was making this argument very strong. So these processes are jointly caused by the agency of organisms and their ecological relations with their affordances. This was what we were exploring today. There is no privileged genetic control. This, I just cannot state this often enough. Developmental systems theory says that, you know, process structuralism, all kinds of views. Um, and the agential view definitely also supports this. So we have to replace nature-nurture divides with an integrated view of the organism, its activity in its perceived environment. The main question of such a theory is how does organisms' purposive behavior impact evolutionary change? We have no idea. We really have no idea. And that includes, of course, change in their perceived environment. That would help us a lot in understanding human evolution over the last 10,000 years, of course. And this question begins with the recognition of organisms as natural, purposive entities, agents that enact evolution through the pursuit of their goals in the struggle for life. And this is beautiful because this perspective brings us back from a genetic view of evolution to Darwin's original view, which was a theory of agential organisms. Okay, so he was still operating at this level uh, of the organism and he took organisms very serious as we saw in the example of the earthworms and how they create their own uh, environment in the soil. So we are here at this junction where we can go back to a more inclusive, more organism-centered evolutionary theory, or at least where we can contextualize the very powerful genetic theories that we have and get a better understanding of where they apply and where they don't. Okay, so these are exciting times in evolutionary biology. You'd think that tons of people would be exploring these different perspectives and possibilities, but no. Most biologists that I know that are working today are working in one single perspective. Genetics of evolution, it's somewhere, it's a vague perspective, somewhere between the structuralist and the functional perspectives that we saw. Even those that claim to radically want to change evolutionary theory, they're stuck in the Newtonian paradigm. Nobody's thinking outside the box. And so in the next module, we're gonna explore why that is. We're gonna have to do a little bit of sociology of science for that. We're gonna have to talk about bullshit, among other things. We're gonna have to talk about pseudo debates and also 
um, the sort of motives behind those. But most of all, we have to think, what is theory in this sense, philosophical sense, not in the sense of mathematical modeling? What is this type of theory supposed to do for evolutionary biology? And why isn't it doing it? So we look at all these things in the next module, and I hope you tune in again. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye now.